All right, welcome back to another episode of the Cape Coral Waterfront Podcast. Today in the studio, I have a special guest, Jimmy Williamson from Williamson Brothers Marine. Williamson Brothers. Williamson Brothers Marine, yes. Yeah, and they do everything. They do roofing and docks and seawalls and all that. Right. Today, we're going to talk about uh, seawalls in specific. So, um, Jimmy, how long have you been in the business? I've been in the business, uh, Joe and I, my brother, uh, 24 years almost now. My grandfather started, though, in 1967. Wow. We grew up uh, working for my grandfather, my uncles, my father. Since we were literally seven years old, I've been in the field. Um, back then, I was just losing tools and getting in the way. But right, right. <laughs> along, the, along the way, we learned the business. And uh, when we um, came of age, we started our own company. Okay. And we're going on our 24th year now. So we represent the fourth generation of uh, marine construction here in southwest Florida. Okay. And I, I was just going to tell a little story. I had questions for Jimmy about seawalls. Actually, not for Jimmy. I just called, like, one of the sales guys at the office. And they said, hey, um, actually, I, I put a response in through Facebook just to say, hey, could I get some questions answered? And Jimmy, owner of the company, calls me up, invited me to breakfast, answered all my questions. It was, like, kind of blew me away because I know you're, like, a multi-generational kind of person, but you treat the business like – you know, like a young, hungry guy. It's like I do. I'm very hungry. Uh, I have five children, and, uh, and they're very hungry. They're very hungry. Very expensive. <laughs> right. But yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm very hands on, especially with the uh, advertising and uh, the marketing. A lot of times, I'll be at home off hours, and uh, when uh, someone will reach out through Facebook Messenger, and it's me personally who's responding to them, and right. Uh, forwarding their leads or their questions. I, I try to deal with it myself. If I can't, um, I forward it to the appropriate individual. And that's where Billy, your sales guy, you know, mm-hmm. he was, uh, he said, Oh, if you just go through Facebook, the person who answers all that stuff is literally Jimmy. He's the guy that responds. Yes. Yep. So that's how we got in touch. And I had some questions about different stuff and we had a nice breakfast and I was really impressed by that level of service. And I've used you guys. I've had several people, like the Huffs had their seawall put in by you guys, and um, just fantastic experience. And your prices were better too because they did shop it. And we are, and not only that, our warranty. We were the only ones with a lifetime warranty for seawalls. Okay, it's one of the something that you can't really put a price on, right? And I mean, every waterfront homeowner owns their seawall, so. Correct. And a lot of people don't understand how seawalls work and like seeing if there's an issue or not really comes down to understanding how the seawall works. Can right. You, can you talk a little bit about the seawall structure? And I'll, I have like an engineering diagram of like the dead men and the tiebacks and all that kind of stuff. But can you talk a little bit about how the seawall is put in and that type yeah, of thing? Yeah. So your, your seawall consists of five foot wide, typically eight foot long precast concrete panels that have tongue and groove sides side connections sort of like a a wood floor as tongue and groove right but but you know of course seawall panels are uh, vertical so we uh, we we excavate basically a ditch in the water set the uh, panels in by means of high pressure water jetting and then we top the seawall with uh, what we call a cap a seawall cap and to keep the wall from tilting forward under the forces of the of the land, uh, we tie it back with uh, epoxy coated steel rods. Every ten feet, you'll have a what we call a tie back. And uh, over the years, you know, when your wall is uh, sixty years old, fifty, sixty years old, those tie backs back in the old days weren't epoxy coated. They're just they were raw steel and okay. they've rusted over time. And uh, what will happen is is when they rust completely in half, your wall will want to tilt forward. Okay. Uh, sometimes, the, and then, you know, of course, that's a problem. So whenever you see your seawall, uh, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself, but just trying to. No, no, no. Go, go for it. Yeah, so when you're standing on your seawall, the best thing to do is look down, uh, and you want to look for the alignment. You want to see that it's straight, that there's no deflection, deflection or bowing of the seawall outward into the canal. If that's occurring... You definitely want to call a professional, hopefully me. And um, um, there's there's things that we can do besides ripping it out and replacing it entirely. We right. we can do some uh, preventative uh, measures to keep it from getting any worse. Um, 
if, if it is to the point where it needs to be replaced, we can come in by land or barge so that uh, even when it's right up next door to your, next to your swimming pool, we can still deal with it effectively without having to uh, remove the swimming pool to access it. We can come in by barge, and we're one of two in the area who do it extensively, This the, the replacement by barge okay. the seawalls. And, of course, we do new construction. Right. And so the, how long are the tiebacks? Tiebacks are... Uh, typically 10 to 12 foot long, um, okay. sometimes uh, longer if the engineer requires it, when engineers are required, uh, called for on the job site. We're doing a, uh, we just did a seawall replacement at Snug Harbor Restaurant. It okay. used to be the old seaport. When you go over the Mantanzas Beach, Mantanzas Pass Bridge, right next door to Nervous Nellie's, literally under the bridge, Fort Myers Beach Bridge, we just put a seawall in front of an existing wall that was failing. The The tiebacks on that are over 20 foot long. Oh, wow. And they're actually uh, helical screwed earth anchors, kind of like the, uh, like the uh, anchors that you twist in the ground to tie down your sheds to keep right. from blowing over in or mobile homes. The thing you use for your beach umbrella. Exactly. The same principle. Uh, we screw those into the uh, earth. A lot of times we do that when we're going, under, we, we, we'll screw them underneath the swimming pool when there isn't room to excavate uh, for a, a tie back. Uh, a, tie, a tie back uh, is anchored into what we call a dead man. It's a third of a cubic yard of concrete. It's just a big square chunk of concrete that the end of the tie back is anchored into. So it's anchored in on the earth's on the land side into the tight into the dead man, and then it ends into the seawall cap. So one end is connected to the cap, and the other end is anchored to the concrete dead man. So if you need a tie back, because the pool setbacks sometimes could get in the way of yeah a lot of feet, and, and right. then that's where the helical earth anchors. Um, Interesting aftermarket tie backs. Um, so they'll just screw a big helix into the dirt. Like to anchor the tie back. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. And like I said, if you guys are confused by the engineering speak here, I'm going to put a diagram up on the screen so you can get like a side view um, idea of how all this works. Because understanding how that all works, like kind of leads you to understand what might be going wrong if you have an issue. Right, right. So a lot of times the, 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 uh, the, the most most common issue, most two common issues uh, the the seawall cap you'll see it's deteriorating, cracking, um, falling pieces of it falling off in the water. Uh, it's not a real big deal. We can remove the cap and do what we call we recap it. Okay. And we put new steel in. And a lot of times we can utilize the existing tiebacks. We can reuse them. Sometimes though, if the tiebacks are too old, we will replace them. Uh, we'll dig new concrete. Uh, dead men or we'll use a uh, helical earth anchors okay when the swimming pool is too close uh the next thing that uh you want to look for on the face of the seawall on the water side right above the mean high water which is right above the oyster line typically right look for uh, fractures cracks in your seawall panel um you'll be hard pressed to go down any canal and canal in cape coral and to not find at least one seawall with cracks in the seawall panels and those cracks don't have to be like monumental big cracks because when the huffs like we went under contract with a lot with them and it it looked fine and he didn't want to have it inspected but then he went back with a friend and they looked from the water and there were just fine hairline cracks right it was cracked substantially enough that it was going to be a problem. Yeah, you know, and sometimes um, I'll point out to homeowners when we're doing consultations for docks, uh, I'll say, Mr. Homeowner, before we build this twenty, thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollar dollars $50,000 wraparound dock and attach it to your seawall, let's address the seawall structural issues because it's criminal of me as a marine contractor to say, oh, yeah, I'm Let's build you a dock and connect it to the seawall that's sh- showing obvious signs right. of stress. Right. You know, um, so 
It'd be like putting granite countertops on top of rotted cabinets. Exactly. You know? Yeah, you wouldn't put wouldn't, you wouldn't put new shutters up on a on a wall of a home that's cracking. Right. And um, so we try to educate the homeowner, let them know, and you know, always tell them I'm not trying to upsell you. Unfortunately, I'm one of the few marine contractors. You know, in the long list, while they're getting an est- they're getting estimates, they're getting multiple bids. Right. Most dock builders aren't going to point at the seawall, point out issues that they should be concerned about. Number one reason is, is they're not seawall contractors. Right. Um, it does them no good. It does not serve their interest for them to say, hey, time out, stop, call my competitor, have him fix your seawall, yeah. and then call me That's back for the happen. gut. <laughs> it's not going to happen because I'm going to come in there and I and I do both services. I do seawalls and docks. Right. And your prices are good. My prices are good, and uh, we stand behind our work. Um, you know, it's and, easy. And, and they might be afraid that that fifty thousand dollar dock budget is going to get eaten up by whatever's wrong with the seawall. So they'll just yeah. throw it on there. And I, you know, and sometimes I tell customers, you know, um, they don't have an endless budget. And I say, listen, you know, if you're going to spend any money in the backyard on your waterfront. Do your seawall first. Right. Um, you know, don't put the cart in front of the horse. You want to address your seawall. Make sure it's structurally sound before you invest any more money that attaches to it. And um, sometimes they're receptive. Sometimes they don't want to hear it. Sometimes they'll tell me, well, my neighbor said that crack's been there for 20 years. Right. And sometimes you'll see fractured seawall panels that never fail. Right. You know, they never fail. Uh, but some... Some do. Well, some guys can smoke till they're 105 years old and never die from it, and some people die when they're 40. Right. You know, and it's kind of, it, it's good to know the truth, though, of what's really catastrophic and what's not. And the thing that I love about working with you guys is if it doesn't need it, you're not going to sell it. You're not out there, you guys are doing work up in Louisiana. You guys are right, busy. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're in Louis, uh, Lake Charles, Louisiana. We're in Pensacola. Right. Uh, and we're also in Panama City, um, all three Obviously, we're affected by the hurricane, hurricanes. And, um, yeah, we, we don't try to upsell, but it, I feel it's criminal not to inform educated homeowner on the status, this, you know, the health of their seawall before they build and attach to it. Right. A lot of times, um, you know, if the seawall cap is in bad enough shape, you start attaching your your joists, your four joists for the or your stringer, we call it in the industry. The, 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 the seawall cap will start cracking and falling apart um, on the during construction, and you tell the homeowner, and they're like, "Well, why didn't you tell me? You know, right. why, that's you. You caused that damage. Right. Um, when when I didn't, I just made it uh, made it obvious once we started attaching to it." All right, so while we're on the subject of like, and this is good that we got into this first, because what a lot of people have who have waterfront want to know is, you know, what are some of the signs that I have a problem? Right. Um, you said cracking in, obviously, if if anything is out of plumb, if the wall isn't going right. straight yeah. up and down, it's a, that's a problem. It's a problem. If um, like the seawall cap, a lot of times will have cracking either on the top or on the front. Tell us what that indicates. Yeah, it's just, uh, so the problem with the old seawall caps they had raw steel in them. They didn't have the epoxy coated rebar. They had raw uncoated rebar. And over time it rusts like all steel does. And when steel rusts, it expands and it expands so much that it pops the concrete around it. It cracks it. And um, the problem with that is the danger at that point is when the seawall cap deteriorates enough, it loses uh, grip of the tie back that's holding it from falling forward. Right. It, you know, it releases and it can literally fall forward. Um, the, uh, the same thing with the seawall panels, they crack a lot of times because this, the rebar rust expands, cracks the concrete. And, um, there's things that we can do besides replacing your seawall to address that. We can put in aftermarket tie backs to take the load off the panel. And then of course we can remove the, we can jackhammer off the top seawall cap and report reform and pour a new one with a new epoxy coated rebar. 
Okay, so you know, the sea ball, the seawall panels have rebar coming out of the top of them that you tie into for the cap, correct? Yeah, they're mainly there for lifting. Okay, lifting points. Okay, um, they do serve a structural purpose, but their main uh, purpose is uh, for installation. And the tie back is anchored into the cap. It is anchored in the, into the cap, uh, and then it goes back into the yard uh, into a big chunk of concrete into the dead man it's like a footer almost okay so if you have cracks in your seawall cap depending on how bad they are that's indicative of corrosion happening inside of there right which could be potentially catastrophic at could some be. point yeah and a lot of times you know it's it's hard to find concrete that doesn't have any cracks in it right just because you have some cracks doesn't mean your seawall is getting ready to fall in um it's when you have a very long continuous crack going down the face, the water side of the seawall cap. And, and on top, you can see it. And it's coincidentally right where the rebar lies underneath that this okay. crack that these cracks run. And see, this is the benefit of using a seawall marine contractor, because you also do docks, for your dock project, because you could eliminate that. He doesn't have a conflict of interest in that point. Because- I don't. I don't. And I can do it uh, more affordably. Right. Okay, so caps, uh, cracks in the cap, uh, obviously cracks in the panels, any type of bowing in or out. When it bows out, that's indicative that the wall is, like, excavated from beneath. Yeah, right? so yeah. So the toe could be blowing out, or the seawall panel itself can be buckling outward. Um, there's two different scenarios there. Can individual panels be replaced? They can be, yeah. A lot of times um, I tell people, You know, it's kind of like Murphy's Law. If this panel broke, assume the one next to it's going to break. It's just not today. It'll be tomorrow. Right. So I try to give them an option, you know, hey, we can address the immediate problem for this amount of money, or here's option B. We can do the entire thing, assuming that eventually this is going to happen to the entire seawall. It's it's the same age. Right. Same construction standard was used. So it's probably going to happen in the future. The other thing that I see as a realtor going around showing people prop- properties is where the seams are. Mm-hmm. There'll be a divot in the yard. Right, sinkholes. Right, and yeah. that's just because when the tide goes in and out, that wall is semi-permeable at the seams, right? The tide yeah, goes in yeah, and out. so the seawall panels interlock, tongue and groove, right? Um, and, that, and that's at the seam. And over time, that tongue and groove deteriorates. Uh, it's, you know, the, the, the panel... Is, isn't as thick at that point as it is the rest of the panel. So it, sometimes during installation, it's stressed so much. It doesn't really fall apart then, but 20, 30 years down the road, those uh, small uh, cracks that you didn't see the naked eye expand and deteriorate completely. And then that's where you lose the uh, – you have uh, erosion loss. And so for the erosion loss – I like I see people fill them with concrete. Like people actually put a bag of concrete mm-hmm. down there and then fill right. it up. What yeah. is the correct way if you have some of that erosion taking place to remedy that? The ideal way is to excavate behind the seawall and install filter cloth. It's basically like a landscape fabric that you put in your garden, but it's a heavier mill industrial quality filter fabric. And uh, we lay that up against the wall. So, and then we backfill it, and that allows uh, the water to pass through, but it retains the soil. Okay. A lot of times, though, when you have a 50-year-old, 60-year-old seawall, over the years, people have put bags of sackcrete down the hole. Yeah. There's coconuts, there's boat batteries, right. Jimmy Hoffa, who knows? Like, <laughs> right. There's Just anything to f- And the stop. problem is, is I tell, you know, you, try to give a customer an estimate or right? it's going to be this much per sinkhole. Well, I get there and I find that I can't excavate. I can't dig behind the wall because somebody else has come in there and incorrectly repaired it. Now right. it's a huge job to remove all that concrete and all that debris. So a lot of times we're forced to repair it from the front side of the seawall. And um, we can do that by two different means. We can put hydraulic cement, um, which is an underwater curing cement okay that will seal the joint um we also sometimes 
pour a cast in place piece of concrete up the seam. If you see a seawall that has vinyl corrugated seawall panels, right? Every five feet in front of the wall, what they've done is they've, they've they're blocking that seam from leaking further. Um, if you ask a structural engineer if that's kosher, they don't like it because um, hydrostatic pressure isn't being released during the heavy rains. It isn't being allowed to right. escape. And with that hydrostatic pressure buildup, you have the likelihood of blowing the wall out. Right. You know? And that's what happened during Hurricane Irma. There was so much rain from... Oh, that's what blew seawalls out? Yeah, well, see, Tropical Storm Harvey came through a couple weeks before Irma, and 18 inches of rain fell on Cape Coral. So the, the soil was saturated. And then when Hurricane Irma came through, all the water was drawn out of the canal. So you didn't have that water pressure pushing against the panel, helping support it. So with the increase of uh, saturated, the hydrostatic pressure, simultaneously the water's drawn out. It just, perfect right. storm just buckled. Right. So you had a lot of seawall panels that probably had telltale signs and cracking that just let go. Uh, that's why I say a lot, to a lot of people, times uh, you know the seawalls that didn't fall during irma many many are standing that are <clears throat> are damaged um they just did they, they they were just strong enough not to collapse right you know hundreds fell after irma but there's a lot of seawalls out there that i can see on low tide you dry down the canal you can see the crack um it runs down the seawall on the face of the panels it's just a matter of time if they don't do something about it. And there are things that you can do besides replacing the wall. We can drill a hole through the face of the wall and insert a stainless steel rod. Okay. It's an aftermarket tie back. I've seen them where you see like a nut on the you outside. You see a big, right. And unfortunately, a lot of times you see a, a rusted nut because they right. didn't use stainless steel. Right. You know, they used galvanized steel. It's just a corroded, looks like something from the wreck of the Titanic. Yeah, it's just, it's, why did you even bother if you're not going to do it right? Use stainless steel. And we all, that's all we use. There's, there is, you'll never find galvanized steel on any of our docks or. And you don't, what do you think about the corrugated panels? Corrugated panels, um, I have nothing against them. They're good for certain applications. When you have a seawall that's failing, that's showing signs of buckling, and it's right in front of the swimming pool, like, Here's the swimming pool. Here's the seawall. It's a good idea not to remove the old seawall to put in a new one because during that period of time of construction, all of this earth is going to undermine the uh, it's going to the swimming pool will, will collapse on you. Right. I've seen it start to happen. So what's the remedy for that then? You put vinyl corrugated seawall panels right in front of the existing wall. It's okay. beginning to fail. Hasn't failed yet, but it's beginning to. And that's not an issue with it sticking out into the canal a little bit? That's a good question. So you're allowed to go out into the waterway 18 inches, the Army Corps of Engineers says. Okay. If the seawall panel is just beginning to buckle, we still have enough room with that 18 inches to install a vinyl panel and a new seawall cap. It will not exceed that 18 inches. Okay. If the seawall is buckled, at let's say a 25 degree angle well it's sticking out so far into the waterway already that if i put a new vinyl wall in front of it corrugated vinyl wall it's going to exceed that 18 inches right it's not going to be allowed by the army corps engineer okay that's a good time to use corrugated vinyl um you know and it's a preference thing too aesthetics you know 900 percent 99.9% of your seawalls in Cape Coral are precast concrete. Right. Um, if it, you have some corrugated things sticking out in the canal foot, it doesn't really look as good. It doesn't look as good. It doesn't match. Um, if you got a dock over it, I guess. It does, know, yeah, right. You it, get a captain's walk. Right. And I think uh, the city of Cape Coral, at this point, they're not allowing um, new construction, standalone vinyl con um, corrugated vinyl seawalls yet. I think they're going to begin to, um, but a lot of people. Uh, it and then and then there's the then there's the price aspect. Um, the product itself, vinyl, 
is more expensive than concrete. The labor that's required to form the cap for a corrugated vinyl wall as opposed to a precast straight wall is much higher. It takes me a lot more labor to cap a vinyl wall. Because of the corrugations, all of my boards that support the forming of the concrete have gaps in them, right? Yeah, so I have to notch all of that. It's oh. I have to custom make. You have to become a trim carpenter. You have to be a tr- become a trim carpenter. It's a lot of time, a lot of labor. Um, so we don't want to go the vinyl route unless we have to. Right. Okay. And um, so those are, like, if you're a homeowner and you already have a seawall, then those are some of the telltale signs to look for if you have a problem. Capping in, cracking in the cap, uh, bowing of any sort, cracks in the face of the cap. Right, and it's best to look at your, your seawall at low tide for the cracks on the face of the right. seawall panels. And from the water, if you can. Which... From the water, yeah, while you're on the boat, cruise down your seawall. Right. Take a look at it. Um, it wouldn't hurt to get a handyman to scrape the oysters off the face of the seawall so that you can really see, because there's a lot of stuff you can't see because of the oysters. Right, or if you have kids like you, you could just go out and put your kids on it. Put your kids on it. Go, go scrape those right. oysters or you're not getting yeah. a new bike for Christmas. Right. Right. But, um, yeah, so um, just keeping an eye on it will solve a lot of problems in the future. Okay, and for the people that are just considering buying a home on the water, because the seawall is something that's a big concern because they ain't cheap when they go, you know, south. Right. So what um, – I reckon, like, people get a home inspection. The home inspector will include, like, if you have a seawall, they charge you a little bit extra. But the seawall guy, the home inspector guy is not, he doesn't have the eye that you have, obviously. He doesn't. I've seen them fail. I've seen, I've I've met with homeowners, recent homeowners. They just bought the home. They said, okay, now I'd like a dock. I get out there and I say, well, before you get a dock, let's talk about your seawall. It's got cracks in the panels. And they say, well, my home inspector didn't tell me that. You know, right. why didn't he, you know? Your home inspector wasn't on a barge when he was seven. Yeah, he wasn't <laughs> on a barge when he was seven. A lot of, sometimes, you know, uh, in their defense, the tide was high. Right. And they couldn't see the seawall panel. Um, and, you know, and a lot of times, you know, they're not sitting there just studying, you know, looking for what I'm looking for from experience. They're looking for a major misalignment of Boeing chunks of concrete missing a lot of times they'll catch all that but sometimes there's things they miss and i just i have a i have a good eye for it obviously so i like with swimming pools we had an issue i've had three people this year who've bought a home with a leaking swimming pool and like a leaking swimming pool is easy to hide because you just fill it up for the home inspection i had Um, one home inspector's not going to sit there for three days and see if it's low right sometimes it's expensive and they have to you know get it done sometimes it's just something simple um I would recommend that they have a, a seawall inspection done Definitely. if it's in the budget. What does yeah. it cost to have a seawall inspection? I believe right now we're two hundred fifty dollars. Yeah, for a seawall. It's inspection. pretty cheap insurance because what does seawall cost really a foot to replace? Uh, so if so, new construction we're approximately one hundred fifty dollars a foot. Um, behind it, an existing home by barge, it goes anywhere from three hundred to a thousand dollars a foot. Really? Yeah, a thousand bucks a foot. It can be a thousand dollars a foot when your seawall is very close to the home. Wow! Because I have to do a, I have to build, I have to do so much preventative uh, measures to keep the, you know, when the swimming pool is here and the seawall is here. Yeah, that thing is going in the water if you don't do it right. Yeah, so I have to drive temporary panels. I have to build two seawalls. I have to put in temporary sheet pile. Right to to retain the earth right here, so that I can excavate right here. Okay, it's a lot of labor. So for an eighty foot wide lot, it could be eighty grand if it's like depending on how close that thing is. Yeah, well, you know when I said a thousand dollar a foot because that's the highest I've bid ever. There was a, a home off of um, Palaco Grand or Savona, one of those streets, right after Irma, near the end. Of, they were on the cul de sac. And their home, you know, I could touch the house and, and the seawall. The seawall was completely gone. You could see the footers of the home. Oh, my gosh. It had, it had gone so bad. And, um, matter of fact, the competitor's price was um, was almost identical to mine. 
but it, he had given them a quote uh, quicker than me, so I, he got the job. Uh, but typically, it's like three hundred ish. You said three. Yeah, about three hundred dollars. Um, three hundred to three hundred fifty is the is is your average. And but what that what that'll include is uh, backfill grade repairing the sod. Okay. Repairing the sprinklers that got torn up, you know, that are right behind the seawall. Right, because that's going to happen. Right. Um, every job is different, but you can assume, you know, if it's an 80-foot replacement, they're like um, $300, $350 a linear foot. Right. So at 300 to $350 a linear foot, if you're paying 250 bucks for seawall inspection, yeah. it's pretty cheap insurance it's to pretty, find out that, hey, this thing has some major problems. Yeah, in the seller, you know, they, they hate seeing me pull up because of I'm not there to crush anybody's deal, transaction. I tell people that are, I, I tell potential buyers, you know, a seawall is just no different than your roof. It isn't meant to last forever. Right, you know your your roof has to be replaced every twenty years or so. Your driveway is not going to last forever. Your seawall is not going to last for ever either. And um, things need maintenance. Sometimes things need to be replaced. Uh, right, and a seawall is not like your car where you get oil change every three thousand miles. It's just like it lasts for a long, long time, and then all of a sudden it just needs a replacement. Yeah, you're going to get you know at today's standards, you're going to get uh, fifty plus years out of your seawall. Right, so if you replace the seawall, if you're old enough to buy a house on the water, it's pretty much lifetime right. for that. Yeah. But you want to know going in because an extra twenty five grand is not something you want to find out about two months after you bought the house and you go to put a dock on it. Exactly, you know, and that's, uh, and that's negotiation uh, leverage right. for the buyer. And just like it costs four or five hundred bucks for a home inspection, it could cost two fifty, three hundred for a, like a guy to go dive the pool to make sure it doesn't leak. It's two fifty for you know to inspect the seawall, but I mean all these things if they go completely south, you'll wish you had done it beforehand. Oh yeah. So if you're buying a house on the water, I highly recommend getting a seawall inspection. Definitely. Okay, so um, if the um, like, let's talk about the precast cap because most caps are poured in place, right? Yep, most caps are uh, formed and poured in place. That's how I grew up doing it. Okay, and you have. A precast cap. Yeah, we have a precast cap. It's going through the approval stages right now with the CAK Coral. We've been going back and forth, um, my, our engineer, the city's engineer, and um, been tweaking the design to make the engineers happy. And uh, so we're in the middle of that process right now. And we're at the end, end stages right now. So it looks like okay. soon, fingers crossed, uh, we'll be uh, – installing the first precast seawall caps in the nation no do you, other do you have a patent on it we actually have a patent uh, application in patent pending and um it's been uh i don't know when did we speak first about six oh, it's six been, months ago yeah i have a patent it takes like two years like that's, yeah so you know it's an, lucky yeah it's uh it's not as cut and dry a process as I thought it was going to be. No, it's not. We're almost to the point uh, in frustration where we don't even care about the pad. You know, right. like, God bless you. If you want to do what we're doing, jump in. Water's deep. Because the other problem is you got to enforce the patent, and that takes energy as well if somebody else does it. It does. It does. And, um, you know, we're not out there trying to uh, be in that situation. We just want to find a quick affordable way to serve our clients. Right. And the benefit of that, like we spoke about uh, six months or so ago, is that when you pour that cap in place, you have to wait for that to dry. And if you're in a construction phase where you get the seawall done first and then they start to build the home, you have to wait a certain amount of time for that to set up, correct? Yeah, your concrete, you want to allow it um, a minimum of 10 days to cure before we backfill it. The, 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 the benefit of Precasting these seawall caps at the uh, yard at our shop is that we have um, the ability to do it uh, under under cover. We don't have to worry about the rain during the pouring of the concrete. Right, it's more controlled environment. It's more controlled environment. Uh, it's it's easier to f- form and pour concrete on land than it is over water. Sure. There's a lot of challenges. Pouring seawall caps is, is, is pretty tough. You know, finding a 
finding a, a crew of men that are good at it, it's, it's, it's challenging. I'm sure. But it, um, pre-casting it, you know, gives us that assurance that we can do it in the right weather conditions that we prefer, that uh, everything is perfect. We just literally go out there and set it in place. Set it in place, and then you can backfill it immediately. Can theoretically backfill it immediately. Um, so the first, the, the our first uh, idea was to adhere the seawall cap to the wall with a structural foam, for lack okay. of a better word. Okay. Um, although it would probably work, engineers didn't like it. So now we're um, those damn engineers. Those damn engineers. Yeah. They um, now we're looking at a, a grout uh, to adhere it. Okay, and um, we tweaked the design of the cap also at the same time. So it's been a process. We're getting there. Hopefully, um, this year we'll be using it. Does the cap, the cap has like a channel on the underside of it? It does. It has okay. a channel underneath. That you can just set it right down, and um, we tweaked that design to make it a deeper channel. Okay. And um, instead of using the structural foam, using a uh, high-strength grout. Yeah, engineering anything is always a process. It is. It's always, there's always like, I have this great idea, and they're like, yeah, but X, Y, and Z. And then you're like, oh, but there's this. And it's like, oh, yeah, but there's that. It's always give and take. Yeah, it is. So, all right, the seawall regulations, the codes have changed over the years. And you see now... If you go out looking at waterfront, there are like one property has a seawall cap that's taller than the one next to it. Right. That's the new standard, right? Is the higher. Yeah. So right now, as it stands today, you're allowed to go 12 inches higher than uh, the neighboring seawall. Okay. But at the same time, you can say, well, Jimmy, I see guys that are 18 inches higher. Uh, And it's true. The city of Cape Coral uh, was allowing us to go higher than 12 inches than the neighboring seawall, and they put a stop to it. They said, for at this point, um, 12 inches higher than your neighboring seawall. But in the near future, they are going to mandate in most areas that they be 24 inches higher than what they are right now. So why wouldn't they let you go higher now? Because if it's if higher is better and they know the future standard. They want a fixed elevation of seawall cap so you don't have, for aesthetics, going down the canal, having seawalls up and down, up and down. They want to have a strict elevation standard. Can you raise the height of a seawall cap that's already there? Like if it went to 24 and yours is at 12, you can only fix that with new panels, right? You can only fix that really with new panels. I mean, theoretically, you could make it higher, but it's going to look so like... So there are going to be whoop de doos in the future because if the current standard is 12 inches above now and it's going to be 24, you can't expect people who bought yeah. a 50-year wall to replace it for aesthetics. Right, yeah. So right now the standard isn't 12 inches higher. Right now the standard is whatever your uh, neighbor is, but you're allowed to go 12 inches higher than that right now. Okay. But uh, soon they're going to be revisiting the code, the uh, standard, to mandate allow to go higher, to go two feet higher. A lot of the uh, insurance requirements for homes, for flood insurance, um, makes it necessary to raise the seawall elevation. And a lot of times uh, the seawall elevation is so low, like in the yacht club area. Yeah, it's like five and a half feet or something. And when you build your, your home elevation foundation up, you got this steep, down to your yard uh, seawall, it's like almost unusable, some of the right. slopes, some of the grades here in the Cape. So if you raise that seawall up, it doesn't make that grade so extreme. And that's why clients of mine did that. And it didn't cost as much extra as I would have thought to right. go up that extra couple of feet. Right, right. And uh, so some of the standards, some of the things they're talking about changing, they've been talking about since after Irma, is um, the tie back. She asked me how long they are. 10 feet. Well, they're going to be 15 foot longer. They're going to be 15 feet total. Will that, will that change the rear setback for the pools? Good question. Um, it won't change, and that was our concern. You know, hey, are we going to be getting into the swimming pool zone? Are they going to be digging up our tiebacks while they're excavating the 
uh, the hope is the, the plan, the mass shows that they dive underneath that area. They're going to be deeper than the swimming okay. pool shell itself. And with those helical ground anchors, most likely? No, we're going to be using the standard. During new construction, we'll be doing the standard. Dead men? Dead men in, in the, in the uh, epoxy-coated uh, rebar tieback. Um, It'll just be set deeper and at a downward angle instead of at... It's not necessarily going to be deeper, um, but if you follow that angle, the further you go back, the deeper it ends up at the end, at right. the end point. And then um, the steel itself, right now it's grade 60 rebar, epoxy-coated rebar. They want it to be 100-grade, low-carbon steel, not even epoxy-coated, but just 100-grade, which... It's better than epoxy coated steel. It's more uh, right. corrosion resistant. Like sixty to hundred grade. That's a lot of grades higher. It is a lot of grades higher. It's more expensive. They want um, larger seawall caps. The, the engineer uh, that the city hired. And your caps are already bigger. Than- we're already there. Yeah, we're all, we you know anticipating those changes and seeing the need for it. You know, right now the standard seawall cap is eight inches thick, sixteen inches wide. Um, ours are 10 inches thick, 20 inches wide. Yeah. And, um, I know when I show a home, if you like, I, I know if it's one of your seawalls. Yeah. The cap really stands. This cap looks like a captain's walk. Yeah. It's a monster. Yeah. Yeah. So that, um, leads me to my next thing is what makes you guys better than the competition? We already talked about a lot of that. Yeah. But what other, um, elements of the Williamson seawalls make them? Yeah. So, you know, there's three major seawall manufacturers here in Cape Coral. I'm one of two of them that makes mixes their own concrete. Right. You have your own concrete plant. We have our own concrete plant. So, And I'm the only one um, of those three that gets their concrete tested regularly. Um, we have an independent laboratory do a... Uh, I don't even know the name of it. They crush the concrete. Okay. And they tell you what it... They tell you what PSI it actually is. Okay. Um, so we do that regularly. And uh, we sell also to the uh, public, you know, and sell to other contractors our seawall panels. We don't just make them for ourselves. Uh, we, we sell them to competitors sometimes. And with that, we need to give them the assurance that everything's tested. Um, a lot of times when you order concrete from a concrete company, they will have leftover concrete in the truck from the last delivery. And to save money, to increase their bottom line, they won't throw that one yard of concrete away. They'll add nine yards of concrete to your 10-yard really? order. Oh, yeah. And just dilute the quality of your entire thing by... Yeah, I, I actually used to, when I was 23, right, right before I started my own company, um, I drove cement trucks. I delivered concrete. And a lot of times we would have a yard left over. Well, the problem is when you mix a yard of quote unquote hot concrete with nine yards of fresh concrete, you accelerate the curing time. You, it really kicks it off. We call it, it's, it's hot mud. Okay. And it, that's not good for you, the consumer. And, um, cause the setup time is going to affect the overall quality and integrity of the batch. Yeah. It's just, it, it's not, it's not a good thing to mix old concrete with new concrete. Right. So that's one of the things that we can point at makes ourselves. And we believe so much in our product that again, we're the only ones who offer a lifetime warranty on our seawall. It's just unheard of. Nobody else does it. And is that transferable or is that just lifetime warranty for the original it, buyer? It's just for the original buyer. Okay. It's not, it's not transferable. Okay. All right. And, um, but what we'll do is we allow it to transfer when it's a home builder. If it's a home builder building a new home, he sits on the home for a year and then sells it to, uh, an, to somebody. We, we, we will allow the transfer at that point. Right. You know, it, it wouldn't be fair. You know, he's only got the thing for a year. Right. But yeah, if you go out and look at waterfront homes, you'll be able to tell after watching this, you'll be able to tell. You just look and say, oh, my God, that's probably a Williamson Seawall because the cap is huge. It's huge. Everything just looks like, you yeah. know, super tough. Yeah. You know, when I um, and especially our docks, when customers meet with me, I let them know that when we're done building your dock, um, 
you'll know when you go down the canal, you'll know it that you have the best looking dock on the canal. Just it's it's not bragging; it's just a fact. We build something that looks like almost like a cabinet over water. If you go to uh, uh, Williamson Bros Marine on Facebook, I got a lot of photos and drone videos. I just did one right before I came here. Yeah. I just did a drone video of what is probably the largest residential dock in Cape Coral. It's oh, really? A, it's a monster. You just built it? We just finished it, yeah. You use a DJI drone? I do. Yep. Yeah. It's my third one. Yeah. Two have uh, been in the canals. Oh, you ditched them? Oh, yeah. Did you have the insurance? The second time I did. Yeah. 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 It don't, then it, you know, so I paid 140 for the insurance, and then I guess you know the deductible upon my claim was like $120. Still cheaper. Right, three hundred bucks is cheaper than nine hundred. Dropping the whole thing in the water. Yeah, both times I was able to extract my SD card. You know. <laughs> and did it read? Oh yeah, yeah. I've yeah. had several go through the wash because my wife does not empty pockets. <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah. you know, please check I, my pockets. Right, I always tease my wife. I tell her, you know, make sure there's no small children in my pockets because. She doesn't check. She just whatever. If it's in that pile, it's going in the wash. Right, right, right. Yeah, I don't do that because who knows what my son's got in his pocket, you know? Right, right. And if it's going in with my stuff, it could be an ink pen. Who knows, Yeah, you know? So, okay, so um, we talked about price. Um, you, can actually, um, you can actually just replace the cap, right? You can just replace the cap. If the cap has like, uh, and, and this is the whole thing, if you get to it early, you notice that the cap is cracked, has a bunch of, you know, deficiencies in it, you can replace the cap independent of the seawall and potentially avoid the catastrophe of the whole thing falling Definitely. in the drink. Right. What does it cost per foot? And just so that you guys know, we're recording this around Thanksgiving time, 2020. So if you watch this video 10 years from now on YouTube, um, right. these are 2020 prices. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What is the uh, seawall cap per foot? Almost $100 a linear foot for a recap. Okay. And, and you know, some people will say, wow, $100, it's 150 for a new wall. You know, new construction, you're a hundred dollars for just a recap. It's so, hundred and fifty if there's no seawall there. If it's just a vacant land, no right. home there, right. I can come in there generally for hundred and fifty dollars a linear foot and because it's wide open access. It's very easy to get to. Yeah. Now when I'm removing the seawall cap from behind a home, it's a whole different story as far as labor intensity and uh you might have to logistics. deconstruct a dock, all that stuff. There's all kinds of stuff there. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, so you're going to spend about eight grand to recap a seawall cap on a regular 80 foot lot. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. So that's it, around $150 a linear foot for seawall cap. And like we said, three to three fifty for seawalls on the low end, 150 for new construction seawall, 150 for new construction seawall. And, and of course that includes a seawall cap and then a hundred dollars a linear foot for a recap. Right. When it's behind an existing home and, and yeah, when you guys go out shopping for a house, it's worth the money to have these guys inspect it. Definitely, yeah. It's you, twenty five, thirty grand. If if you buy, obviously the house that was a thousand bucks a foot was a pretty special, big time house. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 the the house actually wasn't that big, but because of the close proximity to the seawall, it was just very difficult. Right. Um, and you know, a lot of times you're not just looking at one home during the buying process. You know, if I do an inspection and give you a written report for one home that you're looking at, you're informed and educated enough from that one inspection that you know what to look for on the other homes. You don't have to pay 250 every time. Well, re- yeah, realistically, it, it usually, but while some people are shopping, they just want to be on the water to be on the water. Some people, if they have like a 63 foot Lazara, they just need a certain, there's only a certain number of homes where that boat will fit. So right. they got to be there. Yeah. Um, and you know, during the inspection process, that's where, especially if you're paying cash and it's all your money, you know, even if it's not, you're responsible for it anyway. You want to make sure that, you know, the integrity of that seawall is there. Yeah. Because you're going to build a dock and invest a bunch of other money in it. And just knowing that up front, let's say it is 30, 40, 50,000 bucks for seawall. That's the time to find out about it is before. The ink is dry in the contract for sure. Many times when I go down the canals, I'll see brand new million dollar homes, multi million dollar homes built in front of an old seawall. And it was, they had the opportunity to replace that wall while the land was vacant because it was a teardown. Right. They tore the house down and they built a new home. They left that wall there. 
It's crazy. Or they it was a vacant lot that had an old wall, and they built this big, beautiful new home. It's it is crazy, and it really bites them in the in the future. Because in the grand scheme of things, if like, it's hard to build a new house on a canal for under eight fifty, by the time you take the dirt value, cheapest stuff even in the yacht club is two fifty to three, and then five hundred for a de- decent twenty three hundred square foot house. You're gonna have eight fifty into it. And, like, what's the difference? And the new homes, yeah, you know, so if you said, hey, how much to replace this re- replace this seawall in a vacant lot? There's a lot of vacant lots that have the old seawalls there. It's like 200 bucks, 220 Because you have the access. Because we have the access. Right. Now, if you go there and you build a home, the way they build homes now, they're very close to the seawall. Right. Ten you feet. Know, ten feet, or is that... Is that yeah. yeah, I don't even know. I Your just, setback's like 10 feet. I just say they're too close. but Right, uh, from your perspective. Yeah, they're very close. Um, you know, the closer you are to the wall, the more expensive it is going to be to replace the wall. The closer you are to the wall, the more pressure is being put on the wall. Right. Too. Hey, what about mangroves? Yeah, so mangroves, if we find mangroves on the vacant lot, you ask for an estimate. Um, we give you the same price that you're permitting. It's going to be tied up a little, little bit longer. And for, and I really can't tell you from my experience because I have a permitting technician who handles all that. But it's um, you know like if you said hey we signed the contract start my seawall tomorrow Jimmy it takes me about thirty days at most to get you a seawall permit and be working. That's pretty quick. Pretty quick. Now if mangroves are involved in it, they may require mitigation where they'll say hey you get you actually have to pay them for the environmental impact that you're causing and then they give that as a settlement to the chipmunk that used to live on them yeah there's a mitigation <laughs> bank so they have mitigation banks like on pine island when you leave met when you go through matt lache before, between matt lache um where the matt lache bridge is right in between there and pine island center all that land is a mitigation bank they came in there a company and restored all of this land that had uh exotic uh, invasive plants it had Malalukas, Australian pines, so they restored. They took, they removed all those, and it and they created what they call a mitigation bank. You know, oh, they wow. they invested their money to remove and restore that land to its original condition, and in turn, they can sell that credit to a developer. So, when I want to rip out a hundred feet of mangrove, you pay them. I pay. I pay. It's, I'm not sure who the check is cut to because um, it's not in department, but ultimately I pay them. You know, the mitigation bank. Well, that makes it's a lot a of trade. Sense. It's a trade. It's a trade off. You know, I'm taking away some environment, and they're putting back some environment. And so they get credits, and then you pay them for the- you pay for those credits. Yeah, and they're not real, and they're not real cheap. So you can literally, if there were mangroves in the way of the seawall, you can actually remove those and then pay the people. Yeah, you pay the state. You know, you you, you pay them, but it's ultimately that mitigation bank. Sounds like a racket. It's a hell of a racket. But it's necessary. You know, it's good, you know, because, you know, the impact that we're causing uh, construction, they're offsetting by restoring natural lands. Okay. Um, So... If, do you have a – we've already been talking for 56 minutes, so I'd say we, like, come back and talk about docks and roofs love another to. time. We'd we'll love to. Okay, so we'll uh, we'll cover docks and roofs another time. If people want to get a hold of you, right? Um, what's the best way for them to do that? Phone number, uh, 844-WB-BUILT, 844-WB-BUILT. Okay, and I'll have that on the screen as a card. Thank you. And uh, what's your website? My uh, website is wbdocs.com. wbdocs.com. And if you go on Facebook and you're sitting there at night and you see the Williamson Brothers Marine page and you ask him a question, this guy's going to be on the other end of that. It'll be me in a hot tub with a cigar and beverage. That's that's right. So while you're in your underwear watching TV, you can send Jimmy a message in his hot tub. Yes. And he'll uh, and he'll get you the information you need immediately. And if uh, if you got this far in the video, um, if you would give uh, give Jimmy a like and subscribe if you want to see uh, more content like this, I like to do these things because 
like when we met and had breakfast there, I learned a lot. I had a bunch of questions because I have this like engineering nerd brain and I wanted to know how all the stuff works. And he's like, Hey, let's go have breakfast. And it's just good for people to get an opportunity to get to meet you and, you know, hear some of this stuff from the expert. But if you have more specific questions, just reach out to uh, Williamson brothers and they'll take care of you. Thank you. All right. Hey, thanks for taking the time, Jimmy. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. All right, man.